sensible chat. Budgeting made easy. Really easy. Welcome to Sensible Chat with your host, Sensible Bobby, the show that is all about budgeting. In this episode, we'll talk about making good on your financial New Year's resolutions, how to avoid post-holiday buyer's remorse, and we're excited to hear from our guest professor during the Sensible University segment, author and CPA Michelle Kagan. Sensible Bobby and Michelle will talk about how to keep more of your paycheck without ticking off the IRS and her latest book, Budgeting 101. But first, the one that makes it all happen, here she is, Sensible Bobby. Thank you, Scott, for that awesome introduction. And welcome to the new year. We're, what, three weeks in now? I know. I can't believe it's already 2019. I know. And uh, the most scary part of it to me is I've already probably killed a lot of my New Year's resolutions. How about you? (laughs) Well, they pretty much stopped when they started. I'm not really good at resolutions, so... Yeah, you know, you're not the only one. I just read a story in U.S. News that said approximately 80%, 80% of all New Year's resolutions fail by the second week of February. So that means we've got another couple of weeks before we can, you know. Wow, I didn't even make it to February. <laughs> I know. Sorry to say. So many people don't. It's just crazy. I mean, most of us make the New Year's resolutions in December during a holiday dinner or whatever. But by the time we get to the new year and I don't know, I guess call it a holiday hangover or something. And It's tough. It's discipline. And facing your personality foibles, if you will, is, is always tough to do. Absolutely. I know it is for me. Probably why I never really stick to any New Year's resolutions. I shouldn't say that. I have stuck to some and I, I do OK, but there's always room for improvement. Yeah, I've certainly killed a lot of mine over the years. I've got some this year that I'm pretty confident about that I'm still on track for. So I'm hoping for the best. But the good news is that if you've faltered, there's still time to get back up on the horse. That's right. Exactly. There is always tomorrow. And don't forget that. I mean, don't let it kill you that you faltered. I've been there so many times and I'm sure I will throughout the course of my life. Most people will, but don't let it devastate you. It's just like anything, losing weight, saving money, putting away for your retirement. If you just stop for a second, don't beat yourself up too bad like I know I'm prone to do and just move on. Again, the sun will come up tomorrow. (laughs) Thank you, Annie. (laughs) I I, I know I didn't want to sound too corny, but it's really the truth. No, it is. But if you've made financial New Year's resolutions, what I can say from my own experience is a lot of them falter because they can be overwhelming. And if you look at something in its totality, it can be really overwhelming. So that kind of stops you before you get started. But the most important thing about any financial New Year's resolution is having that goal. And before you can make a financial goal, you kind of have to know where you are right now. You kind of have to have a sense of your financial picture. If you don't have a picture of where you are today, then you're going to miss things along the way. Kind of like planning a trip. Yeah. How do you know how to get where you're going if you don't even look at the map? Yeah, but how can you get directions? Like if I was going to call you and ask for directions, you would say, well, where are you right now? If I don't know where I am, how can you give me directions to where I'm trying to get? Makes it pretty hard. So if you just do one thing towards your financial goal, let it be to make this financial picture because that's the foundation of anywhere that you're going to go. And that in and of itself can be a little overwhelming. So just for right now, make it a goal to just create your financial picture, because that's going to be the starting ground to any of the financial New Year's resolutions that you have. And we're going to talk about how to do that with Michelle Kagan. And don't let the remorse get to you. Speaking (laughs) of remorse... Ah, yes. Buyer's remorse. It's always a wonderful thing. And this is a good time of year to talk about this, too, because that seems like the other part of the holiday hangover, if you will. And especially right now, we're in the third week of January, which means most people are probably starting to get those credit card bills, which is going to include all of that holiday spending. Oh, joy. Oh, my gosh. When you said all the holiday bills are starting to come in, all of a sudden, I just had a picture of a funeral dirge going down the street (laughs) in Louisiana somewhere in the big easy it really is a painful thing when you have to deal with that remorse and then you you stop to kind of think about what your plan was throughout your holiday buying and then you really come to understand that you didn't have a plan at all 
And so there's more remorse on top of the remorse of the horrible gifts that you already bought for somebody because you didn't know what to get them because you didn't have a plan. Planning is just so essential to everything. It's amazing. I know. It's unreal. I mean, how many years did we spend without a Christmas or a holiday budget? Uh, let's see. We've been married 20 in April, so <laughs> oh, 20. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll say 19, 19 because this one was actually, this was our first Christmas where we actually put it together, uh, got it together, I should say, and really had a plan and knew what was budgeted for everybody and knew what we were going to get, actually put thought, I shouldn't say put thought into it for the first time because we thought about what to get them before, but you just never know. You're taking a chance or maybe you're going out on a wing and a prayer with something a little different or unique. What if they don't like it? What if it's more than you want to spend, but you buy it anyway and then... Yeah, it's never ending. And I mean, I remember every year after the holidays, is we would always say, okay, next year, next year, we're going to be prepared. Next year, we're going to make sure that we have the money in time that we don't have to go out and buy stuff at, you know, the last minute. I mean, I don't like to get gifts that it's clear that somebody just bought it because they felt like they had to buy me something, you know. I would rather them save their money than do that. But at the same time, there are certain people that you feel obligated to buy for. And so there's that too, but you would rather have the time to put some thought into the gift. And we always said that we would plan ahead so that we would have money to just buy something when we found it, put it away for Christmas, and by the time we got to Christmas, it would be clear sailing and we wouldn't end up in the mall on December 23rd when it's just a nut house. Oh, I just felt a little sad when you said mall. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It scares me. You know, I've heard this from a lot of people that in January, they always talk about, yeah, yeah, next year is going to be different. Next year is going to be different. But now they're dealing with the stress of the money that they spent this past Christmas because like I said, their credit card bills just came in. And so by the time they get over that stress, it's like they're on to their daily lives and Christmas gets forgotten about because it's so far away. It just kind of gets wrapped up in the stress of their everyday lives. Yeah. And now you're just adding more stress upon stress upon stress. Absolutely. It's the epitome of a vicious cycle. So in doing a little math, it comes to my attention that if you can start in January, I mean, if you have to wait until February, March, something like that, that's fine. But at least make the plan in January and just sit down and figure out what you need. You know, because if I'm trying to pay a thousand dollars in December for Christmas gifts, for a lot of us, it's very hard to come up with a thousand dollars out of the blue. But if you divide that by 12 and save for it every month, it's not so daunting at all. When you put it on paper and you see everything that involves your financial life right there in front of you, it makes all the difference. It's night and day. Uh, You start to see the silly little things that you're spending on. You know, a dollar here, two dollars here, four dollars here, five dollars there, how it all adds up, how you could have actually taken the trip that you didn't think you'd be able to take because it always seems so unattainable. I mean, that's kind of what the financial picture does because it shows you where things are going. And once you can see that, you can redirect your money to where it is that you actually want it to be. Okay, class, Sensible University is now in session. Today's guest professor is Michelle Kagan, CPA and author of Budgeting 101. For over 20 years, Michelle has focused on helping people navigate their personal and business finances to solidify their financial futures. She's authored several books and dozens of articles about accounting and finance, making complicated financial theories easy to understand. Michelle has dedicated her career to helping people gain financial independence. Michelle, thanks for being our guest professor in the classroom today. Well, thank you for having me, Bobby. It's a, it's a really important topic, and I'm glad to talk about it. I'm really excited to get into your book, Budgeting 101. There's so much great information in there. But since you're a CPA, I really have to ask you this question first. I okay. keep reading that if you're getting a tax refund, you're giving the IRS an interest-free loan all year long. So they say that the better thing to do is to adjust your paycheck withholdings so that you keep more money throughout the year instead of giving it off to the IRS. And this seems like a great idea to me, except for I am deathly afraid of the IRS. I don't want a tax bill at the end of the year. So my question to you is, how do I adjust to get more throughout the year, but make sure I don't get a tax bill at the end? Wow. Okay. 
it is true that it is so much better for you to have your money than for the IRS to have your money, especially for people living paycheck to paycheck. You know, if you normally get, for example, a thousand dollar refund, that's 83 extra dollars every month. And when you're living paycheck to paycheck, that can mean the difference. And since the average refund is almost $3,000 a year, that can make a big difference month to month. A lot of people are scared of the IRS. And the truth is, they are so much less scary than people think they are, honestly. And there is an absolute way to make sure that you don't get stuck with a giant tax bill or a tax penalty. As long as you pay 90% of the taxes you owe this year, or at least the same amount that you paid last year, you won't get a penalty if you don't pay enough. You'll have to pay the balance, but you won't have to pay anything on top of that. That's called their safe haven rule. For high earners, it has to be 110% of last year. But this year changes everything. Yeah. So nobody's going to know if they withheld the right amount this year until after tax season's over. It's kind of impossible to tell. So is there a time during the year when they can go to, uh, say, a CPA or a tax preparer to sit down with them and say, okay, this is what you need to do to make sure that you're in the right place? Well, yes, but there's a much less expensive way to do that. And it's just going to the IRS website where there's a tool. It's the withholding calculator. And it's a free tool on the IRS website. And it sort of lets you know if what you've been paying in estimated taxes or haven't taken out with withholding is going to cover you for the year. And you can do it, you know, five times a year. You can change your withholding 20 times a year if you want to. If you're doing estimated tax payments, you're a little more stuck in. But if you have a job where you're getting taxes taken out, you can adjust that as often as you need to. So if you are getting more money in your paycheck every month, I also read a lot of times that you should save that money so that you're getting the interest instead of giving it away to the IRS. But like you were mentioning, for a lot of us that are lower earners, it could be $83 a paycheck, something like that. Not significant given the fact that interest rates are so low. So is putting it in the bank and saving it the best way to go? Well, I got to tell you, if you're like, I don't know, millions and millions of Americans who are living paycheck to paycheck, yes, even if you're getting 0.1% interest, it's more than zero. And even if you're getting 0% interest, you're still building up savings that will come in very handy when something unexpected come up. And Bobby, unexpected things come up all the time. Your dog gets sick and needs an extra vet bill. You get a flat tire and AAA has to come tow your car. Things happen all the time. And if you have a cushion, even if it's not earning interest, you don't have to turn to a credit card, which definitely will cost you a lot in interest. And that leads right into talking about your book, because now that we've got some extra cash each month, the next thing to do is figure out how to budget that so that we can use it in the best possible way. So let's dive into your book, Budgeting 101. I love this line from your introduction. Budgeting doesn't mean sacrifice. It means choice. Explain this for us a little bit, because I think it's what stops a lot of people from budgeting in the first place. You know, that's a really good point. And people associate budgets with cutting back, but that's not what they're for. They're actually for letting you decide where you want to spend your money before it's gone. So you can make sure you're using the money for the things you want to do. Now, when you first start budgeting, the first thing that you need to do is get a clear picture of your current financial situation. Tell us why this is important and what's the simplest way to achieve it? Okay, this is going to sound crazy, but most people that I've worked with have absolutely no idea what their financial picture is before they sit down and look at it. This is even more true now where you don't even need to take a credit card out of your wallet to pay for something. You can just wave your phone or you can just, you know, have a website, save your credit card. And most people have no idea how much money they're spending, how much they owe overall, what their assets are if they have assets. They don't know how much they have saved for retirement or what the fees are in their retirement plans. And when you sit down and look at everything as a whole, a lot of people are really surprised with what they see. And it helps them make better choices moving forward when they can see where their money has been going in the past. 
Now, I'm not going to pretend this is a super easy thing to do and it'll take 20 seconds, but it is going to take, I don't know, an afternoon. And honestly, the easiest way to get everything organized is to either, if you're a screen person, you know, get a bunch of screens up that show with all your account balances. Don't do this over public Wi-Fi. Just had to put that in there. Or you can just print out something and just pick a day and get all your balances, credit card, mortgage, savings account, checkings account, retirement, just get every balance for everything, every bill on the same day, just for a starting point. And then the easiest way to organize that all, quite honestly, is just through one of the budgeting apps like Mint or YNAB. Whichever one works best for you is the one you should use because they're all pretty similar in the end goal. But just putting it all together in one place, it'll give you a lot more peace of mind than you think. People think it will stress them out, but actually, once you know what's going on and you have a way to address it, it's a lot less stressful. For me personally, I find worrying about money more stressful than planning what to do with my money. And it can become fun, right? Well, fun. (laughs) But you know what? For some people, it is fun. For me, honestly, it's not fun. I'm not one of the people who tracks everything all the time, which sounds weird because I'm a CPA, right? (laughs) I think that I would be the one like looking at my balances every day. But I'm sort of a once every 30 to 60 days, I take a look at it, check in. Some people like to do it a lot more frequently. People who are new to it will do it a lot more frequently. It's really whatever fits for you. I mean, honestly, the idea of a budget is to help you put your money where you want it to be. If what you want to spend your money on is lattes and lunches out, then that's where your money should be going. And you shouldn't accidentally be spending it on something you don't want to be spending it on. Definitely. And it's nice to know from someone who doesn't particularly enjoy the process, but still, obviously, you know the benefits of it. And so that keeps you going, right? Well, yeah. And you know what? It's not fun for me to, you know, look at my expenses, but it is eye opening. You know, like I'll say, oh, my God, I spent one hundred and thirty dollars on dog food. My dogs are eating better than I am. Right. You know, you don't realize. And again, especially with Apple Pay and things like that, you don't know where your money's going. You don't realize how much you're spending. It's very surprising when people look and see where their money is actually going. And it's not always where they want it to be going. I think that was the most eye-opening thing for me when I started budgeting is finding out where that money was actually going and how I could actually redirect it and the benefits that would come with it. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you've been wanting to take a vacation and you never seem to be able to save up for it and then you realize, wow, you know, I have a magazine subscription from five years ago that I never canceled. There's your vacation right there. And it makes it so much easier because you always think that you're going to have to sacrifice one for the other. And that's not necessarily true. Like you said, if you've got, you know, a subscription you're not even using anymore, you don't have to sacrifice anything. You're just redirecting money that you're wasting. I mean, even things like bank fees. If you can stop paying bank fees, that's more money you get to keep. Absolutely. Now, in order to budget effectively, you've got to have some goals. And in the book, you have an acronym for goal setting, SMART. Can you explain what SMART stands for? Yeah, I can. And I didn't make it up. It's a common budgeting goal. And of course, they made it so that it would fit the acronym, but it's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. And some of those sound the same. They're not. Specific means, you know, you can't just say, I want to buy a car. You have to say something like, within two years, I want to save $5,000 toward a used Subaru. Because just saying a generalized goal, you can't tell if you're getting there, which brings us to measurable. If you know you want to save $5,000 in two years, you can track what your progress is. If you just have this general goal, I want to buy a car, there's nothing to track. You can't measure your progress. Achievable is also something that is actually possible to happen. If you are currently living paycheck to paycheck and you have $15,000 in credit card debt and student loan debt, it is not achievable for you to save $200 a month. It's just not. And you don't want to set a goal that you can't meet because it's depressing and it (laughs) stinks, quite frankly. So you don't want to set yourself up for a goal that you can't achieve. I mean, realistic kind of fits in that too. 
but that's more of a numbers based. So you want to make sure that the goal that you set in dollar terms is realistic based on your current income and expenses. And time bound is you want to set a time limit on it. You don't want to just say, I want to save up $50,000 to retire. You want to say, I want to save $50,000 within 15 years so I can retire. It took me so long to realize that that's so important because if your goals, like you said, if your goals aren't specific, they're just going to be kind of out there. And how can you achieve them if you don't really know what you're trying to achieve? And what I sort of tell people sometimes is that a goal is a dream with a plan. Oh, I like that. Okay, let's move on to something that I had a hard time learning. When I was a kid, first starting in the workforce, just like many, I was making minimum wage and I felt like I needed more money. So I took on another job, took on another job. Pretty soon I had four jobs at once. And, you know, over the years, my income increased, but my financial life didn't get better like I thought it would. And it took me a lot of years to realize that I had fallen into lifestyle creep. Tell us what lifestyle creep is and how we can stop it. It's really hard to stop. Honestly, it is until you're aware of it. And then it's another really eye opening experience. I mean, most people have gone through something like that, where as you start to make more money, you get a better apartment a nicer car. You need to dress differently for work. You start going out to lunch with your coworkers. All those things increase the amount of your expenses. And it still may be less than you're making, but it's still more than you were spending before you had more money. It's very easy to live up to your income because we always feel like it's sort of an American thing that more is better. And if you're making more money, then you can have a bigger car, a bigger house, more clothes, you know, a pool membership. We're not really encouraged to save. We're encouraged to spend. It's a really cultural thing. Once you sort of stop and take a step back and say, how much of what I'm spending on do I really need and do I really want and how much of a difference does it make in my life? Many people will make different choices. Not everybody, but many people will. And the other thing that's really important for people to remember is what you see posted on Instagram and Facebook are not realistic. There are pictures of vacations and cars and things like that, but you don't know what's behind it. The people taking this glamorous, you know, vacation around the world and it's like, wow, why can't I be doing that? You don't know that they're not $40,000 in debt because of it. And even like people in your own neighborhood, somebody's like, wow, they just got a brand new car. Well, sure, but maybe they're about to declare bankruptcy. You just, you can't tell what's really happening in someone's financial situation by the picture they present on the outside. That's so true. And it's just, you know, you read about keeping up with the Joneses. And I used to have a friend that I thought, gosh, she has all these things and I wish that I could have those things. And then I started listening to her and she was always talking about how stressed she was about money. And I'm thinking, I have a really ugly green couch in my apartment, but nobody's calling me as a collector. So I'm okay with that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I would rather personally spend less and stress less. Right. That's not how everybody works. Absolutely. But when you finally realize that you're in lifestyle creep, I would think that making a budget at that point would be a really good thing, because especially if you know that your income is going to increase even more from there, you can make a plan ahead of time so that when that income comes, you kind of know where do you want to direct it instead of just getting more toys, right? Absolutely. If you pre-divert your money, that is the very best way to make sure your money is doing what you want it to do is automate it so that you never have it in your hands. Because once you have it, it's really hard to not spend it. But if it's directed somewhere else and it goes somewhere else, you won't spend it because it'll be not part of your checking account. Most people who have some kind of direct deposit, you can usually use at least two accounts so you can automatically get some of your paycheck sent to savings. But even if it's stuck in your checking account, you can do automatic withdrawals to a savings account, an investment account, an IRA, a Roth IRA, or just somewhere else so the money's not just sitting there. And that kind of rolls right into my next question was that, and especially in your book, you cover all these different ways to budget methods for saving, paying off debt. And there's so many choices out there. How do you choose the best process? 
I think you have to honestly just try a few different things and figure out what feels the most comfortable for you. It's really personal preference because there are a lot of tools to use and there are a lot of different ways to do things. And the one that fits your situation and your comfort level is the one that will be the most helpful for you. I have to say that I generally recommend that everybody pay off debt before they do anything else, before retirement savings, before emergency savings, especially credit card debt, in my opinion. If you have credit card debt, that should be your number one priority to get rid of it. Okay, that's interesting because I was just having this talk with someone yesterday. They have this chunk of money and they have debt, but they also are uncomfortable with how much savings they have. And the question always becomes, because I agree, I mean, you know, if you're paying interest on debt, why wouldn't you just get rid of that? You're paying out extra every month and you want to stop doing that. But at the same time, if you don't have any savings, what happens if something comes up? You're paying all this money to the credit card to pay it off, but now your car breaks down. Now you have to put that on credit. So are you kind of defeating the purpose? It's a controversial opinion, I know. But I would still say paying down the debt because if you have an emergency, yes, you can put it on the credit card. Absolutely. It's not the best idea. But if you are struggling with credit card debt, that is extremely high interest debt. You're getting an automatic 18% return every extra dollar you pay down. And if you pay a couple of times during the month, you reduce your interest even more because the interest charges are based on average daily balance. So if you lower the balance in the beginning of the month, that also helps reduce your interest payment for the month. That means more of your payments go toward principal. So what you're saying is if you pay your credit card, like let's say twice a month, every paycheck, that's actually lowering your interest throughout the month? Yes, absolutely. If you make two $50 payments, like one on the 10th and one on the 30th, or if you make one $100 payment on the 30th, you'll pay more interest with that one payment than with the two. Wow. Great tip. I love that. That's an easy way to save a little bit of money. Yeah, absolutely. And just to go back to the credit card thing, I guess I understand because if you're saving with the fear of not having anything if something happens, but you're still paying the interest on the credit card instead of paying more of that down, then in the end, you're really losing out because if nothing happens and you're paying all that money towards the debt, you're getting it paid off faster And there is a guarantee that you at least have a fallback of the credit card in case something happens. Would that be a good way to look at it? It is. But here's the other thing, too. The more you pay down on a credit card, and I'm saying do not make minimum payments, make more than minimum payments, even if it's $2 or $5 or $10 more, always make more than a minimum payment. Directing any extra money you have to paying down debt is going to reduce your interest payments, which is going to make it easier to pay down because you're paying interest on interest when you have credit card debt. So anything you can do to reduce that is going to reduce the total amount you owe. It's going to get rid of your credit card debt so much faster. And then you'll be able to put money into savings that is really savings and not just sort of a stopgap that doesn't let you pay your credit card down as fast. That makes a lot of sense. It's not a popular opinion. But that's my opinion. Uh, It makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And that kind of leads right into compounding since we're on the subject. The power of compounding has benefits and drawbacks. So since, I mean, you've kind of already covered how it is a drawback, but maybe go into that just a little bit more, how compound interest works. Okay. So let's say you have $10 in the bank and you earn $1 of interest and then you have $11. And then the next time you earn interest, it's on $11. And now you have $12. And then the next time you earn interest, it's on $12. You've done nothing and you've earned $3. Your money is earning money. And the money that it earns is also earning money. So that's what compounding is. It's when the interest that you earn starts earning its own interest. That's so good to know because most of the time we hear about the negative side of interest as with a credit card debt and all of that. So this is the other side of it. When you get out of debt, not only are you no longer paying interest, but now you can be earning your own and just have your money working for you without doing anything. Exactly. I mean, it really, it depends on which side you're on. And it's always better for you to be the one collecting the interest than the one paying it. 
that's a really important piece of information to have because many of us are guilty of spending little bits of cash here and there, especially if we feel poor, because we think the big things are out of reach. The grandiose vacations, we'll never be able to save for that. So I'll just spend 25 bucks here and there. But tell us how little changes in our spending and saving can make a big difference in our overall financial lives. Okay, first I want to say something that relates to what you said earlier in that question, and that there is a lot of guilt and shame around money. And it keeps people from making changes because they don't want to see how much debt they have. They're ashamed of it. And what I will say about that is, whatever your financial situation is, that's what it is. That's the past that's already happened. What matters is what you do next. And if you are spending money on little things that you don't need, instead of paying down debt, you're hurting yourself. And that's just going to bring on more guilt and shame. And I don't want that to happen for you. So So what you should do is be kind to yourself. Yes, I've made money mistakes in the past, but I can turn this around. And just think about the things that you're spending money on. I'm not saying give up your coffee every day. I don't think people should do that. It's like when you're on a super strict diet right. and then you blow it one day and you feel like, well, I've blown it. I'm not going to go back to it. Don't do that to yourself. It's okay to spend a little bit of money when you really need something, but just be aware of why you're buying something. If it's for an emotional pick-me-up, is the thing that you're buying really going to help you as much as getting out of debt will make you feel. Right. And that's the beauty of a budget, right? Because then you can earmark some for that fun stuff. Absolutely. And I think everybody should. Even if you are on a paycheck to paycheck budget and you are super struggling with money, you need to carve out at least a little something for yourself or you will not be able to stick. You need to have something that you like in your life. And you shouldn't feel guilty about doing that. Such an important point. So let's talk payday loans because these are a real sore spot with me. They come with high interest rates, loan shark tactics, and I know they can seem like a good idea if someone is desperate for cash in the moment, but they can be so costly. What's your take on payday loans? I tell you, I call them toxic debt. They are worse than credit card debt because the interest is exorbitant and they often automatically roll over. And people get sort of trapped in a payday loan cycle. And it's really hard to get out of that because the interest is so high. The interest can end up being more than the paycheck was. It's very hard to break out of that. And I honestly believe that the people who offer these shark type payday loans are vultures. I think it's a really awful thing to do to someone who's so desperate in that situation. But I understand the other side of it. When you are desperate and you need some cash, and you don't have enough money to tide you over till payday, what else are you going to do? Well, one of the things to do is reduce your withholding tax to the barest minimum. And yeah, you may owe some taxes at the end of the year, but it's better than having your electricity shut off right now. There are things you can do right now, and there are a few of them outlined in the book. There are things you can do to free up some money right now and help you bust out of that cycle. It's such a relief to hear that because I've been in that situation where I feel desperate and just having those options is calming, I must say. Yeah. And, you know, it's still it's a really stressful situation, but you can get a handle on it. It's not going to happen overnight. It'll probably take a couple of weeks. But once you break out of that cycle, you'll be amazed at how much better your financial situation is. And in the book, you talk about debt settlement scams, too. And we're not going to go into those here. But just really quickly, I just wanted to see if you had any sense of there are a lot of scams. But is there ever a time when there is a good debt settlement option? Well, sure. For example, if you have high credit card debt, you can call your credit card company and say to them, look, I cannot afford to pay this whole thing. And I can't afford with the interest and the penalties that are piling up. Can we work out some kind of payment plan? I mean, you can do things like that yourself. You can call people you owe money to. But you know what? One of the best places to negotiate is medical bills. And that is something that hits a lot of people is medical bills. That's where a lot of people end up in financial situations where they do need payday loans and things like that. But most medical companies, if you just talk to them because of the weird way health insurance and everything works, most medical companies will negotiate with you. And you, again, can do that yourself. Debt settlement companies, I'm not comfortable with them. They charge you money. And a lot of times, 
what they don't do is help you fix your financial situation. They help you sort of what feels like wiping a slate clean, but it also is going to impact your credit score. It's going to impact your ability to get lower interest loans and credit cards later. So you really want to avoid overall debt settlement if you can, but that's not the same thing as calling up some of your creditors and trying to negotiate some kind of reduced balance with them. Basically, you're doing for yourself what the debt settlement companies are going to charge you for and not always work out completely in your favor. Right. And the medical bills, especially doctors and dentists, they understand. And most of them would rather help you out than not get paid. And I've learned the hard, hard, hard way that communication is just so important. I mean, if you communicate with them, like you said, they're going to work with you. And it's so much better than having the creditors pounding down your door because you've been running from them. Yeah. If you take a proactive approach, that's another way to help turn things around. And it's embarrassing. It is. I'm not going to pretend it's not. It's an embarrassing call to make, but making it will help you. Since we're on the subject of desperation and payday loans and kind of being in a situation like that, I guess for me, it feels like that's one of the best reasons to have a budget because it will stop you from falling into these desperate situations. It will help you avoid them going forward. Again, obviously, a budget can't change anything that has already happened, but it can help you make different choices moving forward. And while debt settlement companies are not necessarily a good thing, free or very low cost credit counseling. Yes, credit counseling (laughs) services can be a good idea because they can help you make a budget. They can help you talk to your creditors about payment plans. It's not the same thing as debt settlement. They're more about education and moving forward. But, you know, you also, and it's in the book too, where you have to really watch out for scam artists. So the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission government website has some lists of credit counseling that are legit. You want to make sure you go with someone. You can talk to an accountant. I mean, quite honestly, people send questions to my website all the time and I just answer them because... I think it's really important to help people be more independent financially. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. You've given us so much great information, so much to think about. And the book Budgeting 101 is just chock full of great information. So thanks again for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Bobby. I really appreciate it. Our guest professor today has been Michelle Kagan, CPA and author of Budgeting 101. You can visit her online at michellekagancpa.com. What a great interview. She gave me so much to think about, and I hope you guys got as much out of it as I did. We're definitely going to have to bring her back again soon. The next episode of Sensible Chat is going to be a lot of fun. When I was about six years old living in Lincoln, Nebraska, my older brother's best friend was a little boy named Brenton Mix. Our moms also became best friends, so our family spent a lot of time together. Most of my time was spent tagging along behind his older sister, who probably would have preferred not to have to babysit me, but she was always very kind. Anyway, in time, we moved away and only had sporadic contact with them through the years. But of course, through the magic of Facebook, now we can keep in touch. And it turns out he's become very successful over the years, founding nine companies generating over $2.5 billion in new product revenue and employing nearly 40,000 people around the world. So when I saw the post announcing his new book, The Frequency of Wealth, I knew we had to chat about it. I read his book on New Year's Eve, and it gave me a whole new perspective for 2019. If you could change your mindset and truly experience more health and wealth, would you do it? If you said yes, then tune in next month when Brenton Mix, author of The Frequency of Wealth, will be my guest. If you've got questions for him, email me at sensiblechat at gmail.com or leave a voicemail on the contact page at sensiblechat.com. And let's go deep into the mind of a guy who went from a poor Nebraska child to a multimillionaire. Look for that episode to publish in mid-February. Until then, keep spending and saving the sensible way. That wraps up another episode of Sensible Chat with your host, Sensible Bobby. If you need help with your budget or want to share your thoughts, write to her at sensiblechat at gmail.com or leave a voicemail on the contacts page at sensiblechat.com. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. 